Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. We appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube as we spend the next half hour helping to raise your health IQ. Today, we are going to be answering your questions as we open up the doctor's mailbag. Answering those questions for us today is the one and only Dr. Neil Barnard. And I got to tell you, there are already so many good questions in the mailbag, including we have a question from somebody wondering what the top heart health foods are. So if you want to have a healthy heart, what should you be eating? We're going to get his take on that. Plus, we're going to hear from a woman whose family collectively has lost more than 150 pounds together. How great is that? And she's looking for advice to even take their health to the next level. So we're going to find out how Dr. Barnard can help them out as well. Plus, if you have a question, go ahead and drop that right now in the comments or the chat box. You can even tweet it to us at PCRM or at Chuck Carroll WLC. Just make sure that you use that hashtag exam room live. So let's go ahead and open up that doctor's mailbag and welcome Dr. Neil Barnard to the show. Dr. Barnard, thank you so very much for being here, my friend. Hi there, Chuck. Great to be back with you. It's always a pleasure. It's uh, always such a grab bag when we open up the mailbag and we get so much feedback from listeners of the podcast and viewers of this show who love this because these shows really do cover a little bit of everything. Let's see how we do today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's start with uh, that heart health question. This one comes to us from Instagram. Uh, viewer wondering, for opening narrowed arteries and possibly even reversing heart disease, what are the top foods that we should be focusing on? Okay, uh, let's talk about some basic foods and then a few things for extra credit. For The basics are get away from animal products. Um, and the reason you don't want any meat, any dairy, or any eggs in your diet is they all have cholesterol, all of them, and they all have animal fat in them. And so the cholesterol in say an egg or a steak or in some cheese, that cholesterol adds to the cholesterol particles in your blood, irritates your arteries, narrows the arteries, can lead to heart problems. Um, and the saturated fat, the, the bad fat that predominates in dairy products, and there's also plenty in meat and in eggs, that causes your body, body to make more cholesterol. So rule number one, skip the, the animal products completely. What does that leave you with? Grains, beans, vegetables, fruits, healthy things. Okay, now in the extra credit category, I'm gonna say foods that are high in soluble fiber. You've seen the ads for oatmeal, uh, it'll lower your cholesterol, it's true. Um, the soluble fiber in it is something you can see when you're cooking it in the pan. The oats get all mushy. That's the sign, a sign that the, the fiber in it is actually dissolving in the water and making um, sort of this special medicine that's going to lower your cholesterol. Now, the effect is not huge, uh, maybe a 4% cholesterol lowering, something like that from high uh, soluble fiber foods. And aside from the oats, the bean group is big in that uh, category as well. And soy products seem to have a special cholesterol lowering effect as well. So those would be my tips. Get away from the animal products completely. That way, everything you're eating is cholesterol free, animal fat free, and it's got fiber and the soluble fiber things like oats and beans, extra points. Uh, speaking of cholesterol, which you just mentioned, we have a question here from Cynthia wondering whether or not it's true that free range eggs have less cholesterol than other eggs. Um, mostly not true. Um, the, I'm hedging on that a little bit because, uh, Chickens are bred in different ways, and you can get a breed that has more cholesterol, has less cholesterol. The size of the egg plays a role too, but the differences in all of this are really quite minor. Um, cholesterols, uh, uh, eggs are a cholesterol bomb. They have an enormous amount of uh, cholesterol in them and far more than, than virtually every other food. And the other thing is that free range is a myth. Go to, 
pick up a package, <laughs> look look at a package and don't buy it. Look at a package of free range eggs. Look at look at the address and just drive there and say, I want to see your free range chickens. They are not loping over the hillside running freely. They are in a little pen that might be on a, a piece of grass, but they are not moving around very much at all. Um, and so I'm I'm sorry to say that the green washing or humane washing uh, of the industry has really been shameless and they're selling you an egg. And the only way they sell hundreds of thousands of these or millions of these is by having a huge number of, of animals in not very nice conditions. So skip the egg. Uh, and we're going to be unscrambling some more egg science a little bit later in the show. You and I are going to be talking about a new study that was just released all about eggs that uh, we found very interesting. So stay tuned for that. Next question comes to us as well from Instagram, a viewer by the name of LaFrenchie. Get this, Dr. Barnard. LaFrenchie writes, my family started eating a whole food plant-based diet one year ago. And to date, my fiance has lost 55 pounds and my soon-to-be stepson has lost 85 pounds but I have only lost 10 pounds and my cholesterol is actually a little bit higher. So do you have any advice that could help her catch up in the weight department and maybe examine a thing or two with the cholesterol? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on making the change. Um, you're helping yourself and look how great your family's doing too. That's, that's fantastic. Now losing 10 pounds. That's okay. That's that alone is something to celebrate. That's not failure. That's great. Uh, but you want to lose more than 10 pounds. Um, you already know some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, we want to get away from animal fat because every gram of fat has how many calories in it? It's got nine. This will be on the test. Um, oils also have nine calories uh, per gram. And so getting away from animal fat is good, but keeping vegetable oil is low too. You're probably already doing that. Um, even though oils are healthier in many ways than animal fats, to lose weight, you wanna minimize them all. And that also means minimizing the foods that happen to be really dense in oils, nuts, uh, nut butters, avocado. Okay, so let's say you're doing all that um, and that's going pretty well. Um, do look in your diet to see if some of those things are sneaking in um, and look at the um, products that you buy at the store. If you're getting a frozen pizza, uh, or a frozen burrito or something like that. If it's got more than about three grams of fat per serving, pick a different brand. Um, and the foods that have no label, like the broccoli uh, or the potatoes or something, you can eat as much as you want of, of those things. Uh, you might want to also increase more, uh, increase raw foods in your diet. For some reason that I've never quite figured out, when people are eating a raw carrot, celery, uh, lettuce, and things like that, for some reason, they tend to do better than other people. Um, and lastly, uh, use the E word. Um, exercise does help. Um, running a mile only burns 100 calories, and that's not much. But something about having regular physical activity somehow gets your appetite regulated a little bit. And you'll see the effect on your scale. It doesn't have to be huge, but it's a great thing to, to lace up your sneakers and get that brisk walk in. 40 minutes, three times a week or more if you're game for it. Boy, you want to talk about another health transition. I'm just going to go ahead and say right now, cheers to you, Rich. Get this, Dr. Barnard. Here is his question. He writes, I've been whole food plant-based for two years and lost 110 pounds. He says his cholesterol has dropped to 118. He's even reversed diabetes. But now his morning blood glucose is higher than when he goes to bed. He's wondering, is that anything to worry about? Is that something that he should address? If so, what can he do? Well, first of all, congratulations. How fantastic. I mean, that weight loss is fantastic. Reversing your diabetes, wonderful. Um, I hope your doctor is standing up and cheering for you and telling other people what you've done. So that's that's great. You know, when I was in medical school, we didn't think it was possible. We didn't think it was possible to reverse diabetes. Now we know it's happening and, and you are a testimony to that. So that's great. Okay, so you go to sleep, you check your blood sugar, it's uh, whatever it is, and then you wake up the next morning and it's higher. What happened? Were you sleepwalking and eating donuts? No, that's not it. Um, the reason that happened, it's called the dawn effect, meaning as dawn approaches, your liver thinks, hmm, you'll be getting up soon. You might need a little bit of energy. So your liver takes stored glucose, glycogen, and it releases it into your blood before you're awake. And this, this happens every night. So your blood sugar will start to rise. Now, let's say at six o'clock, you take your blood, uh, at 6 a.m., you take your blood sugar and it's a little bit higher. You went back to sleep, didn't eat, eat any breakfast, 
you got up two hours later, your blood sugar could still be higher. So some of these variations in your blood sugar are actually your body regulating your blood sugar. It has nothing to do with what you eat. So um, keep at it. Keep it vegan. Uh, keep the oil um, to a bare minimum um, because that allows your body to use uh, its insulin in the best possible way. And congratulations with what you've accomplished. That is a, a heck of a transformation. Yeah. 110 pounds. Way to go, Rich. That's awesome. Uh, here's the next question. It comes to us from Barbara, right? This uh, wrote this at 12.11. Wants to know, don't we need some fat in our diet? You do. And it's delivered to you um, as a part of plants. If, if you sent a leaf of spinach to a laboratory, they would tell you, you know, it's about 7% fat or 8 or give or take. Uh, you send some broccoli, uh, even beans maybe 4% fat, something like that, as a percentage of calories. That's not much, but it's what the body actually needs. So your body needs two essential fats. They're called alpha-linolenic acid and linoleic acid. And there are traces of these in plant foods. That's what you need. So when somebody send, gives you a bottle of corn oil, what they do, did was they took a lot of corn and they threw all the corn away. They threw away the pulp, they threw away all the fiber, and they just concentrated that oil and tried to convince you that was normal. Or they give you some extra virgin olive oil. The only way you get that is you throw away the olive. You throw away the pulp and the, the fiber and you concentrate just the oil. That's not the way our bodies were built. Our bodies were built to eat corn or eat olives or eat foods in their natural state. And, and, and when, we, when we eat the expressed oils, it gets more concentrated. This question comes to us from Tigana, it comes to us at 1213, it wants to know, Dr. Barnard, what are your thoughts on a raw vegan diet? I think it's fine. Gen as a general rule, I think having raw foods is a good idea. Um, and part of the reason I say that is I am quite sure that our species did not evolve with sterno. We were not cooking stuff until in the history of the world relatively recently. Um, the question I have though is which are the foods that are best for us raw? And I don't know the answer to that question. The, the reason I, I, I say this is uh, human beings originated in the eastern part of Africa and presumably and migrated out from there into all parts of the world. And so once we ended up in the United States, that was the first time people had tomatoes and peanuts and for that matter, potatoes and lots of other things. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that the raw foods that are best for us are probably those that were in Africa at the time when, of our evolution. And I have no idea what those are. Um, the changes in food availability now are such that you can have foods as part of your life that were never part of our evolution. Having a raw tomato on your salad, great. But that wasn't in Africa when we were evolving. So bottom line, I guess I would say um, more raw food, better. Um, do supplement vitamin B12. You need that no matter what. If you're having trouble maintaining your weight, because raw foods really do tend to lead to weight loss for many people, you might want to bring some uh, cooked food into it, um, cooked grains, cooked beans, cooked greens, um, and um, see how you do. Yannick is checking in all the way from Germany right now, says, uh, been whole food plant-based for 10 weeks and I absolutely love it. However, I'm cooking lots of curry now and most of that requires a can of coconut milk. Should I try to limit that because of fat to just a few servings per month? A few servings per lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to break your heart. Look at, look at the, look at the label and look at the saturated fat number. Um, if it is something very far north of zero, um, what it's reflecting is the fact that the coconut and, and like the uh, like palm oil, coconut oil, palm oil, um, they just have a whole lot of saturated fat. And that's bad for your heart and bad for your brain. And I would add, if you go over to pcrm.org slash recipes, you can probably find a lot of good curry dishes in there that don't have uh, an exorbitant amount of fat in there as well. So Absolutely. just because you're limiting that doesn't mean that you can't have your curry. I promise you that, my friend. Uh, here is a question from Vegan Witchery on Instagram, checking in a little bit early from Halloween, but that's okay. I just read that compounds in flax inhibit iodine uptake. I ate a tablespoon of or a teaspoon. Yeah, a tablespoon, sorry, of ground flax daily and the occasional sea veggie for iodine. Should I be concerned? Thank you so much. Uh, great question. Um, there are some foods 
that theoretically at least do slow down your thyroid gland's ability to take iodine from the foods that you eat. Now, so I'm glad you're having sea vegetables. That's great. They are like the number one source of iodine. They're a great healthy iodine source. So that's great. Um, the flax is probably not an issue. Um, it is true that flax, cruciferous vegetables, even soy, will slow down the iodine absorption by the thyroid a little bit. But it looks from my read of the literature, that that's not really a relevant issue except for people with pretty marginal iodine intake. Um, and if you're having iodine on a normal level, which is sea vegetables, great source. Um, some people use supplements for it. Some people use iodized salt, like a third of a teaspoon per day. Is a pretty good start? Mm -hmm. So my, my guess is, unless it's a really large amount of flax on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I would guess that the effect would be uh, not something you'd notice at all. All right, Dr. Barnard, time to talk about grab and go foods. This is always such a popular talker, especially when people are first transitioning over to a plant-based diet. This is a question from Brian on Twitter. Wants to know, is there a vegan protein bar that would be acceptable just to keep in the car for those days when we're stuck in traffic and real food just isn't accessible? Uh, great question. Um, yeah, you're right. You know, my favorite go-to snack is, um, is to have fruit. Um, and, and there are some fruits that travel better than others, but having them handy when you're in traffic is the greatest thing. Uh, but what about a protein bar if you want to have it? Um, the answer really is look at the label, if, whether it's a Cliff Bar or a Lara Bar or whatever it is. Look at the label. And the ones that are lowest in fat are the ones you want to pick, especially saturated fat. So w when, when you check the labels out, you'll see they vary quite a lot and pick the lowest ones. Question from Bradley. Can you be healthy and still lose weight even when you have vegan processed foods such as plant-based meats or cheeses from time to time? Absolutely, for sure. Um, they vary all over the map. Um, some processed foods like the Impossible Burger, its purpose in life, Impossible Burger is there to seduce meat eaters. So that happens to be one that is pretty high in fat, including saturated fat. So if you're already vegan, it's not designed for you. It's designed to make meat eaters realize that vegan is approachable. Um, once you're um, more comfortable with, with plant-based eating, look for the lower fat brands, but, but it's fine. I mean, you, you will see uh, uh, vegan pizzas and veggie burgers and things like that that are perfectly okay um, to have. Now, as far as daily use goes, the more real the foods are, the better. So lots of vegetables, lots of beans, lots of whole grains, um, lots of fruits. Include them in your routine. Don't forget your B12. But um, to have some processed foods is perfectly okay. Question from a YouTube watcher right now. I'm not sure how white sugar inside of soda is different from the natural sugar found inside of fruit. Are our bodies processing the sugar differently as chemicals, uh, as the different types of sugar that they actually are? Or is it all the same? The main difference is quantity. Um, you pick up an apple or an orange or um, a peach or a pear or just, or just about any piece of fruit. Um, the sugariest ones might have 10 or 20 uh, grams of sugar in them, something like that. But go to the store and get a 20-ounce uh, soda and look at the label, and there's probably 60 grams of sugar in there. Um, and people have one or two of those a day. So that's really the difference is the quantity. Now, that said, sugar is not for many people, their big issue. Granted, extra sugars like those added to sodas are not really health food, but your body is designed to run on glucose. Your, your brain runs, glucose is its favorite fuel. Uh, your muscles too, that's why marathon runners are carbo-loading in the days before their, their marathon. Um, so sugar's not the devil. And when it's in an apple or when it's in a other kind of fruit, it's packed along with fiber, along with other healthy nutrients, and your body can use that in a really healthy way. I think you described sugar once as kind of the Trojan horse when it comes to diabetes. You know, it, it's not necessarily the, the main devil here. It's everything that comes along with it and yeah. the food treating. Well, if you let's say you're making, having a cookie, uh, people will say, oh, my goodness, those cookies, they're so full of carbs and sugar. That's 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 what's you know causing weight problems or leading to other problems. And the sugar is not really health food. But look at the recipe. Um, to make those cookies, you had you dumped in some sugar, but you also threw in a whole stick of butter or a whole bunch of shortening. And so, like the Trojan horse, um, the sugar lures you in. 
It makes you think, I want that. And it's all that fat baked into it that is going to get into your cells and cause insulin resistance that leads to high blood sugar and also leads to obesity and leads to high cholesterol. We have a question here from Vicky wanting to know about the keto diet. What are your thoughts on that? And does it uh, help with diabetes and insulin resistance? And are you aware of any long-term side effects? So a lot to unpack there, but what are your thoughts on the keto diet? I would avoid the keto ketogenic diet. Um, the notion of it is um, really, uh, it, it's based on a mistaken premise, which is that you gained weight because you're eating too much sugar or too much carbohydrate. If you went back 50 years and looked at Japan before Westernization, when the diet was based on enormous amounts of rice, they were the, you know, rice carbohydrate, they were the skinniest, longest lived people on the planet. And if some ketogenic author went there and said, how dare you eat all this rice? Um, and, you know, when you look at what happened when Westernization occurred and their rice intake did fall because it was replaced by more and more meat and dairy products, their waistlines expanded, breast cancer rates doubled, diabetes came in a big way. Um, so the healthy carbohydrate is the fuel that our bodies run on very well. But a ketogenic diet does have an effect um, because they say, don't eat any sugar anymore, don't eat a carbohydrate. So you take away the grains from your diet, gone. Take away the fruit, take away the pasta, take away beans and so forth, you're not left with that much. And so for many people, they do lose weight, but it's only because they are reducing calories. If you eat the same number of calories, you don't lose anything. And is there a danger? That, sure, there is. Because if you're doing it in the typical Atkins way or the typical ketogenic way, your meat portions are increasing because it doesn't have any carbohydrate. And that means your cholesterol goes up. So normally weight loss brings cholesterol down, no matter how you get there. But if you get there by a keto diet, a lot of people have their cholesterol levels going up. Plus, you just threw away some of your best cancer preventers. The fresh fruit's gone. The starchy vegetables are gone. The beans are gone. And you need those things. So the long-term risks we suspect are cardiovascular disease, probably Alzheimer's disease, and colorectal cancer and, and similar things. So why go there? You can go there with a much uh, more pleasant diet that's also healthier in every way, and that's a low-fat, plant-based diet. Question from Mariana here. I was cutting back on sugar and carbs and lost about 40 pounds. I went vegan recently, but I want to stay low in carbs and sugars. Now I'm worried about missing out on certain nutrients. What advice do you have for her? Um, it sounds like you've been hit by carbophobia. Um, keep in mind, as I was mentioning earlier, that you're – in the same way as your Ferrari is designed to run on gasoline, that, that's the fuel. Back at the factory, that's what they said. I'm going to build an engine. That's what it's going to run on. Your engine is designed to run on glucose. Glucose is what comes to you in the form of natural sugars, like in fruit, or in natural starches, as in grains or starchy vegetables. And having these foods is a good idea. And if you think, well, aren't they high in calories? The answer is surprisingly, they're the lowest calorie foods we have. Um, fat has nine calories in a gram. Carbohydrate has only four. And if it's a carbohydrate mixed with fiber, like an apple, the sugar is carbohydrate, the peel is all that fiber. The fiber has no calories, effectively. So those are the foods that are going to help you uh, feel slim. So I would suggest not rejecting them. Uh, nature's handing them to you on a plate, and it's good to take advantage of them. Question from Arlene. Uh, definitely check this one out, if, especially if you like to exercise. She wants to know, what are the best foods for recovery after intense exercise, like a 10-mile run? Uh, great question. Um, I don't presume to want to second guess the experts on our staff, like Susan Levin and Jim Loomis, who have done a lot of talking about this. So Chuck, you're going to have to have them back uh, for another show okay. about, about post-exercise. But um, my good exercising friends do talk about the need to um, – rebuild your body and to reconstitute your glycogen stores. Um, glycogen, as I was mentioning earlier, that's your batteries. That's the stored glucose and it's in your muscles and it's in your liver. And if you went out for your 15 mile run, you kind of used up your glycogen. So you put it back in, you put it back in with carbohydrate. Um, and that means starches like um, root vegetables, grains, beans, fresh fruit, 
all the, those, all those things are fine. Now you might be saying, well, but I hear I need protein after my workout. Um, the fact of the matter is your body was damaged, so to speak, a little bit in the, in the process of all that exercise, but the damage is small, it's microscopic, and so it doesn't call for a steak. The protein that comes along with the healthy plant foods is more than enough to rebuild. Um, hydration is important, uh, as you've always heard, um, both before, during, and well, before, during, and after exercise too. Question from Paula wants to know, is it possible to eat too many calories when you're eating a whole food plant-based diet? No oils, but plenty of fruits and vegetables, low in fat. Probably not. Um, the normal uh, homeostatic mechanism, it, it's in the same way as breathing. Can you breathe too much? Um, you know, you don't think about it, but your body is monitoring the oxygen level in your blood. And if it gets a little bit low, you start breathing faster. You, have, you don't even know this is happening, but it happens automatically. Even when you are unconscious, you are sound asleep, your body is still saying, I think we need a little more oxygen in here and it gets it. Okay, so your body does the same thing. It's kind of looking at your weight, looking at your, your, your body stores, and it says, you, you are, you've been exercising today, you've been pretty active. I'm gonna ramp up your appetite a little bit. And the same way as more breathing brings you more oxygen, a little bit higher appetite brings you more calories. But the beauty of a plant-based diet is that everything you're eating is pretty nat naturally pretty modest in calories and the fiber tricks your brain or tells your brain uh, that you've had enough food and you can stop now. Where people run into trouble is with particularly animal products and really calorie dense foods because there your, your body's telling you to eat more super easy to overdo it on those kinds of foods like cheese 70 percent fat so before you know it you know you've you've, you've overshot so no the short answer is no i think you're gonna do fine and I, I will tell you i think that there are a lot of people who are maybe a little bit scared of not doing calorie counting after they adopt this healthy diet because you've been counting them basically your entire life up to that point. And it's almost unfathomable that you would no longer need to do that because you're eating a nutrient dense diet versus a calorically dense diet. So everything's kind of been inverse, but it takes a while to reprogram the brain upstairs to not yeah. have to worry about that so much. Yeah, I, th I think that's really right. With, with typical grains and beans and vegetables and fruits, your satiety mechanism is gonna come in and stop you from overeating. Um, the only exceptions really are with some psychological issues where people really are, are overdoing it for more emotional reasons. And, and that can certainly happen. In that case, you obviously wanna get some help for that and, and, and address that for, for sure. Um, the physiological exception can be with those few calorie dense plant foods like nuts, uh, nut butters, avocados, and cooking oils. Those are the ones where there's a fair amount of fat the calories get packed in there pretty fast. So, but if those aren't part of your diet, you're gonna you're gonna do fine. I want to say a quick hello and congratulations to Ashioma, who is uh, adopting a vegan diet tomorrow. So, congratulations, welcome. We have a question here from Sally. Wants to know, speaking of fat and calories, how many grams of healthy fat should a person eat every day? How many grams of healthy fat should you have every day? First of all, I hope you don't count, um, and you. you just as we were talking, Chuck, you don't really need to be counting any more than you need to count how many times you breathe or how much oxygen do you get. Um, we, we start counting these things with food because, because in the past we did overdo it and we felt a need to count. But once you're in a better relationship with your body, you don't have to count at all. That said, um, we count as part of research studies so that we're tracking what people do and your average American can easily be consuming, you know, 100 grams of fat in a day or something like that. And around here, we'd probably cut that down to about 20, uh, 25, something like that. Uh, let's grab a couple of more before we close up the doctor's mailbag for the day. We have a question here from Charlene wants to know, how can I avoid sugar spikes and sugar cravings? I'm new to eating a vegan diet. Well, first of all, I'm glad you're doing it. It's great. You know, the, um, it feels a little awkward for some people at first. Um, but not for very long, <laughs> you know, you're gonna get into it really well. Okay, so um, the way that your body regulates sugar is with um, its uh, insulin, the insulin hormone, which comes out of your pancreas and it arrives at your cells and it's just like a key that opens up the cells to sugar. And so what allows your insulin to do its job right? Getting away from fatty foods. 
Surprising, isn't it? But when fat builds up in the cells, insulin can't work anymore. So when you're eating a plant-based diet, there isn't any animal fat in the diet and the cells tend to respond a lot better uh, to your natural insulin. Now, the other piece of it is that if you're eating foods that are really high in refined sugar, a soda, or refined, uh, car uh, refined grains like a piece of white bread, your blood sugars can spike. And for some people, not, not everybody, but for some people, as your blood sugar is coming back down, it can sometimes dip too low. And as it's coming down, cravings will kick in and all kinds of other mischief. And so the answer to that is to be eating the healthier foods. Beans, right. beans peas, lentils, those are the healthy legumes, uh, the high fiber grains, and vegetables and all the varieties that come in. All right. And our last question for the day comes to us from Patricia. Patricia is wondering if you can talk about postmenopausal hormones. She says she can't seem to lose weight even when eating a whole food plant-based diet. I feel your pain. Um, men, men and women both go through the same kind of thing, whereas as the years go by, they discover their metabolism seems slower. You know, when I was 14, I could eat anything, but now that I'm 54, I just look at food and I start gaining weight. Um, when we go on this, this, this diet that we've been talking about, avoiding animal products and keeping oils low, two things will happen. One is that you find that you're taking in fewer calories without knowing it. Um, that's because the high fiber foods are just really satisfying. So that's the first thing. But the second piece of it is that as time goes on, your metabolism actually gets a little bit faster. Now, not a lot, but we measure this. Uh, people come into our laboratory in the morning and we measure how fast they're burning calories. And in the after meal period, that's when a plant-based diet tends to cause a bigger burn. And the way to make this kick in is to stick with it, vegan all the time, no animal products, keep oils really low. Um, and what you'll discover is not only are you taking in fewer calories, but you're burning slightly more calories after every meal. Now there's three meals a day, so you get a little bit bigger burn after every one of them. Let's go ahead and close up that doctor's mailbag for today. If we didn't get to your question, don't worry. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. And if you want to relive the fun that we had today, head on over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you get your favorite podcasts from. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee and hit that subscribe button because we will be releasing a full replay of today's show in podcast version first thing tomorrow morning. So go ahead and subscribe to that now. And if you'd be so kind as to leave a five-star rating, we sure would appreciate that. All right. Today, we talked a little bit about eggs and cholesterol on the show. And Dr. Barnard, there is an interesting new study that was just done over in Europe looking at eggs and the effect that that has on our health, not just cholesterol, but specifically, I believe researchers here, we're looking at eggs and what we in the scientific health community will call all cause mortality. So what did these researchers find? It was a quite a good study. It was published in the European Journal of Nutrition. And researchers looked at more than 20,000 people in Italy. And they watched them over time. They tracked how many eggs they ate and they looked at who lived and who died. And then they adjusted for all kinds of confounding factors like were you smoking and, and, and other things like that. And what they found was what we call a dose response relationship, which is um, really an important thing to find. Uh, the more eggs people ate, the more likely they were to die. So it worked out like if you were eating, say, two eggs a week, not very much, um, your likelihood of dying was substantially higher than people who avoided eggs completely. And people who ate eggs, say, four times a week, what's that, about every other day, were about 50% more likely to, to die during the observation period um, of several years compared to people who avoided eggs. Now, the egg industry would say, ah, it's just one study, forget about it, don't think about it. it. Actually, the clouds have been gathering around the egg industry for some time. There was a study, let me show you that this one came out in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, um, in late 2019, and it was the same thing. And what they looked at was, what happens if you eat a half, a half an egg? Um, and the answer was, you measurably increase your risk of dying over time. Now, nobody eats a half an egg, you eat a whole egg. Um, and if you're doing that every day, the mortality in the JAMA study increased was about 12%. In the Italian study, it was worse. 
uh, then that is about 50%. So what do we make of this? What, what they made of it, uh, the Italian researchers, they said, we should stop recommending eggs. Um, yeah, they're cheap, everybody gets them. It's just something we all grew up with, but they have far more cholesterol than other foods. Is cholesterol good for you? No, uh, you don't need any dietary cholesterol at all. There is zero requirement for dietary cholesterol and there's no reason to be eating it. And that's what they believe is causing the problem. And is high cholesterol, in your opinion, the number one predictor of heart disease? Well, high cholesterol predicts, predicts a couple things. If you have a high cholesterol level, particularly LDL cholesterol, bad cholesterol, yeah, it's a huge predictor of heart disease. But not only that, uh, our friends at Kaiser Permanente years ago looked at people with high cholesterol uh, and found they were also at high risk for Alzheimer's disease. And the kicker of that study was that the cholesterols they measured were when the people were 40 years old. Meaning, if you have a lifelong bad diet, uh, with animal fat and, and, and high cholesterol foods like eggs, that you are just, we believe, building up the damage, not just in your heart, but also in your brain. Um, so our recommendation is that people avoid these things. And what is the target range for cholesterol that people should be striving for? Our friend Richard Hubbard uh, wrote in and said that, uh, I believe he said his was in the 120s. He thinks that that's pretty good. Is that so, too low or, or what no, is the target well, range? I mean, that's, that, that's that's fabulous. I mean, you could auction that off on eBay and somebody buy it like right away. Um, what the government what the government will say is when you get your cholesterol test, they want your total to be below two hundred. Um, now, I would argue that that that's a little liberal. Um, it, that you might want to be way below two hundred, but but if he's at one eighteen, I mean that is very low. Uh, but but not dangerously low. I mean that's that's great. There's a lot of people on plant based diets around the world who have cholesterol levels like that. Um, but the, the more important number is your bad cholesterol, that's LDL cholesterol. And there you, you want that below 100. Um, and some people will get it down to 90, 80, sometimes 70, um, somewhere in that range. And that's where you want it to be. I'm telling you, every time we talk about cholesterol on this program, I'm reminded of the story that somebody told on the show a while back where they had switched up their diet, adopted a, a plant-based diet. Their cholesterol plummets. Their doctor is actually, instead of excited, a little bit concerned and started to tell this person to begin to eat meat again so that they could continue to take their cholesterol medication. That never really computed for me. Well, it's, that's kind of the way people used to handle diet. Well, and some people st still handle diabetes diets. They would say, make sure you eat enough bad food so that your, your insulin still has, a, has a, a role in your life, so to speak. Um, our goal, obviously, is to get you off your insulin if we can. So, um, no, you, you want to follow a healthy plant-based diet that has no cholesterol, no animal fat. So your cholesterol is going to come down. Your LDL will come down for most people. And hopefully, if you have diabetes, it will get better, too. All right, let's switch gears now. Tomorrow is April, and that is the month of all months to take a look at the environment and how our diet actually impacts our living conditions here on Earth. That's why tomorrow, April 1st, the Physicians Committee for the first time is holding a plant-based environmental summit. This is very exciting. We have a lot of leading experts in the environmental field who will be speaking at the summit, which, by the way, is completely free. Dr. Barnard will be presenting there. Dr. Michael Greger will be presenting. Ocean Robbins will be presenting. So many people who are very knowledgeable about this very topic will be speaking at this summit. So what I want to do here as we close out the show is actually give you a little bit of a preview of that summit. So let's go ahead and roll that trailer right now. We have changed the way animals live on a global scale. A global shift to a plant-based diet could reduce greenhouse gases caused by food production by 70%. Every bite you take is a vote. You're voting for the health you want and you're voting for the world you want. The health of our bodies and of the earth are one and the same.
And there you go. You see that web address right there, pcrm.org slash climate summit. Absolutely free event. Highly encourage you to register for that. Kicks off tomorrow. So pcrm.org slash climate summit. Reserve your spot today. And for today, that is all the time that we have, my friend. I want to say thank you one more time to Dr. Neil Barnard for joining us here on the program and to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen. Thank you, guys. And to you, my exam roomies, thank you so very much for hanging out and helping to raise all of our health IQs together. Greatly appreciate you being here, as always. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon. Until then, stay safe, take a stand, and. Keep it plant-based.